Welcome to the Sisterhood of Sweat. I am here today with Beth Brombaz. Thank ah. you so much. There we go. I have to find it. And it's... give me one moment. I'm sorry. I'm trying to share to my it's page. Um, <laughs> I'll um... just take care of that later. <laughs> so I don't waste everybody's time. Hello. Sorry about that. <laughs> Come on, guys. We're going to have to come back because Facebook is on and I can't turn it off. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. Here we go. At least you can always delete it, right? <laughs> yeah, I can always delete it. All right, we are we are back now. That was crazy. Oh, it, I had it all set up so it would be right. I'm just like, oh my god. All right, here we go. Dr. Beth Brombaz is an author, copywriter, and content creator, and is the host of the Blogger to Author podcast. In 2015, she took some of her posts from her fitness blog and turned them into a book. That book has helped Beth build her expert status and has opened many doors for her business. She's passionate about showing fellow bloggers how simple it is to turn their blog posts into a book so they can build authority and credibility in their niche share their passion with the world and earn more money too. Welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me. You're so welcome. So uh, what, where's your little one today? She's napping. I have the monitor <laughs> with me. I'm hoping she'll stay passed out. <laughs> uh, awesome. And how old is she? Uh, she just turned 11 months yesterday. 11 months. That was so sweet. Is she walking? Um, with help. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. And, and Beth basically has got a great job. She can just do it from the home. And uh, so how did you start out with the blogging? And when did you start blogging? I started back in 2012. So just over five years ago, um, started out as I think a lot of bloggers do, just doing sort of like an online journal. <laughs> um, and it morphed into something where I realized that I could start helping people, start teaching them things. And that sort of came along with when I was getting different certifications, when I became a certified running coach, when I became a registered yoga teacher. Uh, and then just really found that it was a great platform where I could teach the lessons I was learning in my own life and help other people live better lives or lives uh, that way. So that's so sort of the you, brief. Okay. So what was your, do you remember what your first blog post was? Oh goodness. I think it was just some generic, like, hi, I'm just posting about, it started out as a running blog. And I think it was just kind of explaining why I started the running blog, which is that everybody around me was totally sick of hearing me talk about running. So <laughs> I <laughs> like, I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I need an outlet for this and I don't want to lose all of my friends. So, uh, yeah, I started the blog. That's awesome. I love that. That's a great reason. And so then you were speaking to the people that wanted to hear all about running. Yes. And you wrote your first book. Mm hmm And can you share with the audience the title and what that first book was? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm not very creative with my book titles. <laughs> the first, my first book is Yoga for Runners. And you guessed it. It is, in fact, about yoga for runners. Uh, as I mentioned, I am both a certified running coach and a registered yoga teacher. I actually went through yoga teacher training because I wanted to be able to teach yoga to runners because it had been so beneficial to me as a runner and really the benefits of yoga for runners are what got me started. But then I totally fell in love with yoga and everything it did for me mentally, emotionally. And I just wanted to share that with the world because it had been so powerful in my own life. Uh, so what I did was took a bunch of blog posts that I had been writing over about a year or a year and a half. And I 
literally copied and pasted them into a Word document. Um, I had to fill in a couple of holes where I had to, you know, maybe write a chapter here or there. I did go through and edit it. So it's not like, you know, a direct copy of what's on my blog, <laughs> but it did allow me to actually write and publish my book in less than 30 days. So it's sort of like my secret to uh, quickly putting together a book and really creating something that can help people have a better life. I love that. And I know I noticed you had a lot of really cool services on your page. Yes. Um, and you like edit for people, you write copy for people, you help them with their websites. So if, you know, you, you need a little bit of, I guess, sprucing up, you could pull it all together. This has evolved into like a whole nother avenue mm -hmm. just because you decided to write a blog. Now you're doing all this other stuff. Absolutely. And I love the whole idea of writing your blog, turning that into your book. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us um, more about that and how, what kind of process you went through to do that? Yeah, absolutely. So really I came up with first the idea for the book or knowing that I wanted to write a book about yoga for runners because that was a subject that I was so passionate about and something that I was really trying to become known as an expert about, that was a natural place for me to put the book together. I had specifically been writing blog posts about yoga for runners just to help people again and teach them things that I knew a lot of runners were struggling with when it came to yoga. I had a couple of classes that I taught in a local studio where I had runners in the class because they knew that I specialized in yoga for runners. They knew that I was a running coach. And so working with those in-person clients and students gave me a lot of great ideas for what to put into my book as well. And so from that knowledge, from listening to my blog audience as well, looking at, uh, comments on my blog, looking at questions I was getting in social media, that sort of thing. I used all of that to put together an outline for the book. So really everything that I thought that somebody who was just getting started with yoga as a runner would need to know. And once I had that outline, it was really easy to go through and say, okay, I have a blog post describing that. I have a blog post describing that oh, this topic is really important to cover, but I don't have a blog post on that yet. So actually what I did was add those topics to my blog editorial calendar and I wrote a post about that particular topic. And then I was able to, again, use that as a first draft that then I did go in and I edited and added a little bit more. But I firmly believe that Editing is a much faster process than actually going through the first round of writing. And so I think that using the material that you already have on your blog, figuring out a way to repurpose it is incredibly smart and it makes the entire process a lot easier. Uh, I totally agree because I wrote for Ms. Fitness Magazine for like 14 years and I took a lot of content and repurposed it in my book. And mm -hmm. uh, also I collaborated on the portion of Fat Flush for Life with Anne Louise Gittleman. And there were parts that they didn't use. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and they're like, yeah, you're welcome to the parts, which was my chapter on motivation. Mm -hmm. So you can definitely repurpose things that you have written. And uh, I, I think it does speed up the process and it gives you mm -hmm. a base, a, a starting point. Yeah. Um, and I it's know, smart too. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh yeah. I know a lot of people out there. There's a lot of people out there that have a book in them. Mm -hmm. They have no idea where to start. Mm -hmm. What are some tips you can give them to make them realize they could write a book and how to begin? Yeah, absolutely. I think just talking to authors first and foremost, or people who have written a book, will inspire you, especially those of us who have self-published, because I think that's a lot easier than figuring out how to write a book proposal and then find an agent. And then your agent has to spend time shopping your proposal around to the right 
publishing house, that sort of thing. Like that's a very involved process, but self-publishing is actually surprisingly easy. So I think that there's that mental shift where you're like, wait a minute, that's something that I could actually do. I think that that's an important first step. Uh, but then after that, just start writing yeah. and get the words out. I think blogging is a great way to start as well. Uh, it just, when you have a blog, you're also building an audience of people who would be interested in buying your book, or even maybe they don't want to necessarily buy it, but maybe they'll tell their friends about it. Uh, they'll probably want to buy it anyway, if they're fans of yours, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. uh, and then if you focus on one or two social media platforms to go along with your blog and focus on building relationships there, that's going to, again, naturally cultivate an audience of people who are going to be ready to buy your book when it comes out. They're going to be your number one fans. They're going to share about your book. They're going to give it to their friends. It's just a smart way to get a platform going that's going to ultimately really launch your book and help you get your book into people's hands. I love that. So it's really important if you're going to write a book to have an audience mm -hmm. and to know what your audience wants, right? Yes. Yes. 100%. Now, yes. how can we figure that out? How can we figure out what our audience wants from us? Yeah. So always be listening first and foremost, listen to the questions they have, ask questions of your audience. And I'll warn you that if you haven't been asking questions of your audience a lot, it does take them a little while to start responding, but it does happen. So ask them questions all the time in your emails. Most of us have a newsletter. Ask them a question like, what are you struggling with? What questions do you have about X topic? And explicitly invite reactions. Make sure that they know that it's not a rhetorical question that you actually want to hear back from them. You know, include a call to action. Reply to this email with your answer. Reply in the comments with your answer. And then even if you have some friends for, say, for example, you're posting this on Facebook. If you have some friends who follow your Facebook page, ask them and say, hey, would you mind just adding in your answers to this real quick? Because a lot of the time, if there's a slight discussion already started, more people are more likely to chime in than they are to be the first person to respond. Okay. And what, what do you do to create more engagement? I mean, do you have any specific things that you do besides asking a question or? Um, I honestly offer to get on the phone with people. That's been really helpful for me. Uh, I essentially send them a Starbucks gift card for oh, <laughs> getting on the really phone great. with me. Uh, well, I see it as if we were, lived in the same town, I would take them out for a cup of coffee, treat them to a cup of coffee and chat about this, you know, just to hear That's back great. from them, to hear what they're saying, that sort of thing. So it's my virtual way of doing that. Um, so I'm very careful to do a lot of listening to not sell anything. That's not my purpose. And then really most people who I get on the phone to, if they, they you know, they tell me where they're at, where they're thinking, and then I'll offer if they're interested to give them, you know, just some free advice for like, these are the next steps that you should take type of thing. Um, just to add in a little bit of value besides the coffee gift card. <laughs> uh, but that works really well for me. And then also surveys as well. Don't be afraid to send out a survey to your audience. Uh, make it kind of short and sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, That'll help encourage people to reply. You could also give away a thank you to, you know, a random person who answers the give or your survey as well. That can help out. Um, just make sure that if you are going to do the giveaway, that it's related to what you're doing. So if I were to say, oh, yeah, take my you know, post to Instagram, especially and say, take my survey and I'm going to give you an iPad. Well, then you're going to get all sorts of people who aren't your ideal client <laughs> answering people that because they want an iPad. iPad. <laughs> exactly. So like, for example, for yoga for runners, a lot of the giveaways I've done to thank people for uh, answering my survey is like a yoga block or a yoga mat or something that directly relates to what the, uh, I guess, what that list is about, what that platform is about, if that makes sense. Oh, total sense. Yeah, those are great creative ideas. Um, why is it so important for readers 
uh, I mean, for for us as writers Mm -hmm. to create a reader avatar and know, you know, know that avatar inside and out. And can you tell everyone that may not know what an avatar is? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Well, the root name is from the same place, but really an avatar is just a detailed description of a single person who you are envisioning as like the perfect person for your brand or your book in this case. So sometimes I'll call this an ideal reader. And this is somebody who you are ultimately trying to reach with your book. And again, you should have one of these for your blog or your social media platforms. If that's something you're also doing, it's incredibly helpful. But what I love about having that really detailed reader avatar is that it allows you to write to that person. You have somebody to write to. You have an idea in your head of his or her knowledge base. So for example, is she just starting out and she knows absolutely nothing? And are you going to need to define a bunch of terms or has she been at it for a little while? And so you're going to kind of go more intermediate with terms, maybe teach some more intermediate strategies in your book, just for example. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so it just helps you really focus your book and figure out what you're going to cover in your book, number one, and then number two, how you're going to present it. What type of words are you going to use? What voice really are you going to write with so that you can best connect to that reader avatar, if that makes sense? Yes, yes, total sense. Why do you think writing a book sets you up as an expert and gives you more authority? So I think Part of it is just that not a lot of people have done it. And for years and years, if you've written a book, you're an expert on the topic. Only people who know a lot about stuff know enough about it to write a book on a subject. And so it does really demonstrate your knowledge base. But then again, we just have been trained as well to see authors as Somebody who, again, they know their stuff. They're an expert. And just, it's still, even in this day and age of self-publishing, it still has this clout that comes with it that if you have a book, you're an expert. You know what you're talking about. And I think that's particularly true of physical or, you know, printed books as opposed to e-books. Um, ebooks are becoming more and more popular. I think yes. <laughs> most serious bloggers have at least one ebook, whether they give it away for free uh, to get people to subscribe to their email list or whether it's something that they sell on their website. Most people have that ebook. A lot of people still like yeah. to be able to hold it in their Totally. Hands. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 100%. And so it's also going to help you to reach a new audience as well. But then again, it, it also, like if you just in your mind think about somebody who just has an ebook versus somebody who would have like that exact same book, but it's in print. Like you can actually see them hold it in their hand. There's a difference like so mentally. <laughs> yes. Yes. We're holding the book in the hands, but I'm just totally. saying a lot. Of, I had a lady buy my book off of mm-hmm. Kindle because she wanted the recipes and she was mm-hmm. really uh, excited to dive into them. And, uh, she also came to my studio yesterday and she wanted a copy because she wants to write in it. Mm-hmm. She wants to hold it in her hands. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's just, it's totally different to like have that tactile sensation of holding it in their hands in terms of the reader, but it's also incredibly fulfilling as an author to actually hold your printed and bound book in your hands as well. Like it's, it's special. It's, it's, it's a chance to, to put your voice out there. Like mm-hmm. um, people don't talk about things that you may write about. And Mm -hmm. um, she said to me, wow, we have a lot more in common than I thought when she started reading my beginning. She Mm -hmm. was like, you're going to get me. You're going to understand me. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like it's this connection that you create as well as being an expert with your audience. 
Yes, yes. So you think about like, how long does it take somebody to read a book? Several hours. That's a lot of time that they're spending with you. I mean, it's through your words, but they're spending it with you. That's a lot longer than they're going to spend on your website or on your Facebook page. That's a very, very special relationship. And I think a lot of people discount that. Yeah, I think so. I think you're right. I think too, there's a sphere around writing the book and, Mm -hmm. you know, are people going to listen to me? You know, are they going to like my book? Am I going to get criticized? I think the perfectionism syndrome holds a lot of people back from actually Mm -hmm. writing. How can we, um, you know, why isn't it necessary to be perfect to write your book? Yeah, I think the number one thing that people need to keep in mind is the people they're helping and stop focusing on themselves and their fear of putting something out that's less than perfect and think about their audience who needs to hear their message. And if you think about the fact that you sitting on your book and waiting until it's perfect, that's fewer people who you're able to help fewer people whose lives you're going to change. Like Linda, if you were still hemming and hawing about finishing the sisterhood of sweat, that woman you spoke to, you wouldn't have created that connection with her. She wouldn't have found that she wouldn't have started to trust you. You wouldn't have been able to help her make her life healthier. And that's just one person out of hundreds and thousands of people, even more who you've helped through your book. And so if you're an aspiring author and perfectionism is holding you back, I think you just really need to get, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, get out of your head and start to bring your focus to the people you're going to help and really remind yourself that your message is needed and that the more you freak out about whether or not it's totally perfect, the fewer people you're ultimately helping. Oh, I love that. And, and, you know, I, I really found that to be true around podcasting mm-hmm. um, because I had listened to Lewis Howes and yes. I was listening to Lori Harder and those were big influences mm-hmm. in my life. And I was kind of sitting back um, because I wanted to podcast. I felt like it was innate. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I think I was comparing myself. And I'm not like them. And yep. so I'm like, oh, but that's, I'm not a spiritual guru, nor am I the business wizard, mm-hmm. you know? And so what happened as I sat back, I learned, I made sure I knew what I was doing. And then I was like, well, if I sit back forever, nobody's ever going to hear the things that they can only hear from me, like mm-hmm. my audience or the person I'm supposed to help the person Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to reach is never going to get what I'm supposed to give them if I just sit back and do nothing. Mm -hmm. So you have to have some courage and step out and unhook yourself also, I think, from worrying about your critics. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, absolutely. Everybody's going to always have critics, unfortunately. And I think it's just about focusing on who you help. I actually keep a Google doc where I screenshot positive messages I get from readers and I keep that in there. And anytime I'm feeling down or if I've been criticized, I go back to that so that I can focus on what really matters, which is the people who I'm helping and the people who need my message. And you know, that's so funny. I had my first critic, Well, I'm sure you have some that you never hear from. Right. And um, they wrote like this review and it was weird because it was saying something about my book being political. I have no politics in my book. (laughs) And so I was just like, huh, scratching my head on that one. But, uh, but I didn't want to bother me. I actually, I said, I'm a real author now. I have a, I have critics. Right. <laughs> I was like, now I'm a real author. So I kind of turned that around to a positive thing. Yes. And the other question I think you ask yourself is, is there any validity there? What can I hear from this person mm-hmm. to help me with my next book? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Or I mean, you can always publish a second edition too, if it's like 
a huge and glaring error, but in most cases, it's not going to be. It's just like, think about there are people out there who just aren't your cup of tea. There are writers who you just like, do not like, even though everybody else totally loves them. Like high school, I had to read of mice and men and I just like, did not like it. I know a lot of people love that book. It's just not my jam. And (laughs) you know, but it, that's, you know, just opinion. And just because somebody doesn't like your book, that doesn't mean it's a bad book. It's just that it, it just wasn't presented in a way that spoke to them, but that's okay. But because that's, how you're going to get readers because the people who love your book are going to love the way you present it and the way somebody else presents the same material may not speak to them. So it's, it's just the way things are. And just, I know it's harder than it sounds like even I say to not take it personally. And I know I struggle with this. So I would say that if you're an author and this happens or really even your blogger, social media, you know, it's okay to like feel disappointed about it, but just try not to like wallow in it, I guess. Yeah. Well, and I just look at it this way too, because also podcasting to me is a lot like blogging and writing Mm -hmm. all all day Mm -hmm. speaking. Um, I, I think like I would have maybe a guest and I would think, I don't know, um, with the podcast, maybe, you know, Mm -hmm. how people were going to receive that. It might not have resonated with me, but mm-hmm. I didn't prejudge and I put it out there. And then I had someone say, I listened to the podcast the other day. I really loved it. That was a great podcast. And you're like, when, well, which one did you listen to? And then it was the one that mm-hmm. I had the question about. And so what didn't resonate with me resonated with her. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like even, you know, like how you were saying is that it, maybe it'll resonate with other readers, but this one person, it does not, does Mm -hmm. not get it. But that's just like you liking vanilla and me liking chocolate. Mm -hmm. And so that shouldn't hold you back from writing, right? Yes, absolutely. And it all kind of ties into, I think that reader avatar idea as well. So that if you are good about advertising who your book is for, you know, in your book sales page, in the description you write on Amazon, if you make sure that they know what to, your readers know what to expect out of your book, then it's also more likely that the right people are going to find your book and buy it. And then you're going to get more and more positive feedback because they're going to know, oh yeah, this book is for me or, oh no, this book is not what I'm looking for. And that's okay. Yeah, I'm kind of realizing I need to have a sequel cookbook to the Sisterhood of Sweat because <laughs> people love the recipes and I always, I'm always creating new ones. And mm-hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm like, all right, I might not be able to wait because I have another book I'm going to start writing here awesome. pretty soon. So yeah, yeah. But once you start, you can't stop. Absolutely. No, I seriously think that's true. Like you figure out like before you start your book, it seems like this impossible thing. And you're like, okay, I'm going to try and go for it anyway. And then you get your first book published and you're like, wow, that was a lot easier than I thought. I'm going to go do another one. It's like, you know, climbing your first mountain. You're like, oh, I don't know if my body's going to do this. And then you get to the top and you're like, yeah, let's do that again next weekend type of thing. Like her first (laughs) marathon, (laughs) that sort of thing. For me, my book, my book was, I don't know. I'm trying to think how many pages this thing is. I think it's like, 225 or something like that Mm -hmm. I felt like I birthed a baby this was my you know and Mm -hmm. so I wasn't quite ready you know if anyone said do you want to have another baby right away when you have a baby you're done Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so I wasn't quite ready to have another baby yet um but now I am I'm ready to have (laughs) ready to have another baby and uh so that's just kind of, I think, depends on how much you spill out into your book, how ready you are to write another. You, mm-hmm. Sometimes it may, you may be ready right away. And sometimes you might be like, I need to wait a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. So how can we uh, choose topics? You know, I know sometimes people get stuck in what to write about. Um, I know checking with your audience, but what are some mm-hmm. other ways that we can decide what our book should be about. Yeah. So like you mentioned, 
always listen to your audience. That's always my number one thing. If you keep getting asked the same question over and over, that's obviously a place to go. Um, but another place to start thinking is what do you want to be known as an expert in? Like, what do you want to be the go-to person for? And that sort of gets a little bit more into niches. Like say you are a food blogger. Well, you know, you can't, you could just write a uh, cookbook on everything, but it wouldn't really uh, sell well in most cases, uh, unless you're like the joy of cooking people. Um, so for most people, it makes sense to niche down. So say, you know, you want to focus on healthy gluten-free desserts or something like that, you know, the coming up with that, again, that thing that you want to be known for. I really wanted to be known as the expert in yoga for runners. There are a lot of running bloggers out there. There are a couple other running bloggers who are also yoga teachers. And they talk about yoga for runners, um, but there aren't too many of us. And so I just wanted to make a bigger name for myself in that niche and let people know that like, hey, come check out my website. I know a lot about this. I've been doing it for a while I know it like the back of my hand. It's my jam. I really want you to come follow me if you want to learn more about that, that sort of thing. Um, so again, it just becomes a calling card and it really helps build your expert status. And so if there is that one thing that you want to be the expert in, absolutely writing a book about that topic is going to help you. And again, if you are co-opting material from your blog, you're going to want to have blog posts about that anyway to show that you're an expert and you know get that traffic to your website as well. Um, another way would be to look at things if you're running your blog as a business. So if you are, for example, putting together an online course or some sort of online program, fitness professionals, maybe you're putting together an online boot camp, how could you write a book that could lead up to that? So you, you're not going to give away absolutely everything that's in that course because you still want people to sign up for the course, but it's a nice like stepping stone to then get people to sign up for your course because maybe people, especially if they don't know you, they're not going to spend a hundred, 150, $200 to sign up for a program with you, but they'll buy your book for $10 or $15. And so again, we, we are talking about how, that book really does help build a relationship with people. So they get that relationship built with you with the book, and then they're more likely to go on and buy a higher priced item or hire you as a coach, that sort of thing. And so consider writing your book as an introductory piece to whatever that next step is, whether it's one-on-one -on -one coaching, whether it's, again, that program, that course, that boot camp. Think about how you can provide value, answer some of the things that they're struggling with, your reader, uh, help them through that and lead them naturally to that next step that you want them to take with you in your business. Well, that, that answered my next question. I'm, <laughs> I'm doing that actually right now. I'm building an online course for the Sisterhood of Sweat that will mm -hmm. launch in January. And, um, I, and I think it's so cool because in my gym, I can be hands-on with people about nutrition or mm -hmm. about their workouts, this gives me an avenue through the book and then through the online course directly yes. to be able to really help people that don't live in my area. And actually mm -hmm. maybe people that do, because it gives them a little more of you um, when you're not, you know, they're not around and they're not able to come to you. And they can yes. just, so I think it's a, a beautiful thing and they really advocated this in the iin uh launch your book it was like the dream mm -hmm. launch course um to make sure when you do write a book that you have some sort of a product in mind mm -hmm. to link with your book and i think it's a very uh smart business um move but it's also giving your audience more value yeah, well, and it just to interject real quick and say that also that book can be great for marketing that service or course or whatever you're doing too. you know, say you're trying to get people to enroll in your course and you're like, hey, my Sisterhood of Sweat course is launching in January and the next 20 people who sign up are also going to get a free copy of my book. That yeah. sort of thing. Or right. even like it's if you're awesome. working one on one, you're like, yeah, you know, sign up for 
uh, you know, three one-on-one sessions with me and I'm going to give you a free copy of my book, that sort of thing. So it can extend to if you're working with people in person as well, or even in a coaching situation, but that book, again, it's just another way to add value too. It's just like the possibilities with the book are practically endless. I feel like, and there's just all sorts of different ways that you can use it. It just does so much for you. Like if, <laughs> I feel like everybody needs to have one, right? <laughs> How important is it to have a pre-sale and a pre-launch and what are some ideas surrounding that? Yeah. So I definitely think it's important, but again, we were talking about perfection. If it doesn't work out, if poop hits the fan and, (laughs) uh, you know, you can't get it done, then I wouldn't let that hold you back. I will say, uh, but with that caveat, that pre-launch the, is really going to build buzz around your book. It's going to help you sell more books. And really, from the moment you decide to write your book, you should be talking about it. You should be talking about it on social media. You should be talking about it to your clients, everybody. Just talk, talk, talk about it because otherwise people are going to forget that you wrote a book. I did this by mistake myself. My second book, I launched a couple of months after giving birth and I was just up to my eyeballs and (laughs) and diapers. Yeah. And just trying to keep client stuff going and everything. And so I did not promote it like I should have. And I still had people where they're like, oh, I didn't know you wrote a book. I'm like, well, I posted it about it on Facebook, but you must not have seen that post. And really that happens all the time. And so I think that your book will be more successful the more you talk about it. And it doesn't have to be all promotional stuff all the time. Like you can talk about what part of the book you're working on. Um, Just what in the day, like, oh yeah, I'm editing chapter two. That's all about, you know, how to do such and such and put it on your Instagram story and post to Facebook about it and just keep in people's minds that your book is coming and then they'll be more likely to support you when it comes around to launch time because they'll also know that you're really excited about it because you talk about it all the time. (laughs) And so they'll want to support you as well. Like people care about you. They want you to succeed and they'll be willing to buy your book book, especially, you know, if it's like 10, 15, 20 bucks, like, yeah, sure. I want to support my friend. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, and I am writing a book starting in January. Yeah. So um, just put that out there. And <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be somewhat of a sequel to the sisterhood of sweat, mm-hmm. but the title is school blazes ahead. Like and it. so it's going to be a great book for women about all the changes that our body makes and how to adjust to those changes. So it's going to be amazing. Yeah. A lot like the sisterhood of sweat working from the inside out. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that you can have a quality of life, no matter what age you are or stage you're in. So yes. I'm pretty excited about that. So that that's amazing. why all the, this is just a timely podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I know a lot of people out there are just like me. They uh, need someone that's done you know, what they, they are going to do that has mm-hmm. the roadmap that has suggestions that can guide them to, you know, be able to write their book and mm-hmm. have the courage to do that. Yeah. And, uh, what are some ways we can test our book ideas? So really the big way that I would do that, especially if you are a blogger or, you know, if you have an online platform, whether that's a email list, whether it's a Facebook page, that sort of thing, just start talking about your book. Um, Listen to what the feedback people give you say, you know, I'm working on this. I'm going to cover this, this, and this, and even ask people, you know, what else would you want to learn about in this book? And just listen to see if you're getting crickets on that. Whereas maybe other people (laughs) would, uh, or maybe you would get more feedback on another post, that sort of thing. Um, you know, obviously email your list and 
mention that to them. But then I think the idea of, again, getting pre-orders really helps you solidify that. Not to mention once people have put down money on the book and you tell them that it's going to be delivered on such and such a day, that sort of lights a fire under you to uh, live up to those expectations. But even if you're not ready to offer pre-orders, start, I would say, almost immediately putting together a mailing list for people who are interested in the book. And so that's a good way to gauge it as well. They're not obligated to follow through, of course, um, and purchase your book, but it will give you an idea of, hey, are people actually interested in learning more about this? Would they actually buy that book? Or is it going to be a lukewarm or colder <laughs> reception? Uh, and maybe there would be a better topic for you to pursue. And you what? could do this with several book topics as well. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, that's okay. What, um, what are some surprising things that you found hard about the book process? For me, I think the mental part is the hardest. And I think that that's true for a lot of my clients as well in terms of just making that decision to make it a priority. Like my second book took way longer than it should have. And granted, like I had some genuine stuff going on. I moved across the country. I had a baby. I was busy. But <laughs> at the same time, I had been trying to write my book for so long and I was hoping to get it done before I had the baby. And just I never had time. But at the same time, it was also because I never made it a priority. Like if something is really important to you, you make it a priority. You do, you rearrange your schedule so that you can finish it. And like when it came to finishing my second book, that's exactly what I did. I had to sit down with my husband and say, I need you to watch the baby for two hours so I can go to the coffee shop and write. Or I would set my alarm an hour early so I could get up and write without being disturbed, that sort of thing. I just had to really make that shift and say, okay, I need to prioritize this so that I can get going. And like, really, I, I know it sounds kind of cliche, but that was, I think the biggest hurdle for me. Wow. I yeah. That makes <laughs> a lot of sense. And it just takes me back to the whole idea again, of repurposing mm -hmm. um, because I had, before I had come across what you had written, um, I had this idea when I was, I was at the School of Greatness, the Summit of Greatness mm -hmm. with Lewis Howes. Mm -hmm. I was sitting in the audience and um, I don't know why. It just all of a sudden thinking about speaking, somebody put it out there to me. What are you going to do? You know, what can I hold you to? And I said, I want to start speaking more. And mm -hmm. I've done some speaking. Um, and recently I kind of stepped outside of the box and I told personal stories that uh, instead of the canned vegetable, eat your greens presentation, yeah. I actually told them real life stories and, and engaged my, my audience much more. And so when I'm sitting listening, you always are trying to decide what kind of speaker would I be? What would I speak about? Mm -hmm. Same as the book. Um, and mm -hmm. I just realized, you know, I really love writing blog posts. I really love writing you know, I like climb to that mountaintop kind of pose through the pouring rain, thunder and lightning hanging from mm -hmm. a cliff kind of <laughs> thing. And um, I'm like, that's what I get passionate about. And so I was thinking, you know, your speaking could just be your blog post come to life. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of the same premise as your blog can be your book. Mm -hmm. And so I think the idea is very brilliant. Oh, thanks. I'm sure I'm not the first one to come up with it, but I just, I guess, want to try and spread that message as much as I can and remind people of the fact that it's okay to repurpose content um, just because I think it's going to make that dream of becoming an author attainable for so many people. Yeah, yeah. And I just, uh, I think it's just, once you really get it, Mm -hmm. Once you really understand what it is you're talking about with turning that blog into, you know, a book, mm -hmm. it really takes some life. And so I, I really uh, just want to acknowledge you for such a, a great concept and 
bringing it forward to everyone and just, you know, that's to me is what it's all about. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, I do have to say that, yeah, helping people with their books is something that I found that I just love. I just had a client who published her book a couple of weeks ago and just, she keeps updating me on how many she sold and this, she just went to a conference and she was able to network with people who she maybe never would have networked without, with who, without the book, but she gave them copies of the book. (laughs) They're, you know, posting to social media and showing like them with the book that she wrote and that sort of thing. And it's just opening doors for her even beyond just book sales. And like, that makes me so happy. And because I know she has a message that needs to be shared with the world. And same thing with current clients who are, I'm working with who are in the middle of their books. Like it's, it's just such a privilege to be able to, again, help people who have a genuine message that people need to hear to help them get that into people's hands. It's, it's fulfilling. (laughs) It's crazy what begins to happen to you when you step out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every, you know, everyone feels afraid. Mm -hmm. Everyone will feel a little fear, but step through that fear because when you do, you're going to see there was really nothing to be afraid of. And, um, it's going to take you to a whole new horizon. Uh, you know, I never in my wildest dreams, um, thought I would be having, you know, a regular from the Steve Harvey show on my podcast, Patrice Washington was just on and she is the money maven. And that was amazing. And then I just had Dr. Fred Pescatori of the A-List diet, the Hamptons diet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're just people like you that had a great idea, stepped into that power. And you realize like, it just, it's amazing what happens to you when you go after your dreams and have belief and step forward into that dream and leave your fear behind what can Mm -hmm. really be possible for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess just the message that I want to hammer home to anybody who's listening to everybody who's listening is that if this is something you want to do, you can do it. It's absolutely doable. So don't let that, again, that fear hold you back. You can do it. I promise. Yes, absolutely. You can. And I still remember when I thought I was only an article girl, like, Mm -hmm. you know, for magazines, I'm just a, you know, one-stop shop article, blog post. And uh, I remember when Anne Louise Gittleman, it's like, well, I want you to collaborate on the fitness portion of my next book. And um, it was sort of the same way that I ever fell into writing. Somebody asked me, uh, to write an article. And I thought, I'm not a writer. Why are you kidding me? And then I thought, I'll take a stab at it. And that became my first article. Mm-hmm. Well, the same kind of feeling with the book, I was like, oh, well, I guess if she doesn't like what I give her, she can just be like, no, sorry. <laughs> and so I just started writing and uh, about 22,000 words later, I thought, And I did that very quickly. I thought Mm -hmm. I could write a book. I think I could write a book. Mm -hmm. And so you will surprise yourself. You just have to start. And uh, what are some ways to get started? Beth? What are some ways, some tips for them to just get out of their own way and get started? Yeah. So especially for any bloggers who are listening, like there's a good chance that you have a good part of a book, if not a full book already in your blog, first and foremost. So like go through your old posts, see what you've got in there. And if there's a topic that you're really passionate about, you've probably blogged about it a lot. And so just take a peek at those blog posts and see what you have. Like you might have 20,000 words worth of coverage of that topic within your blog already. And you don't even know it. Like literally you have a book sitting in your blog and you just don't realize it. And that's totally possible. Um, If you're not quite there yet, I think the easiest thing to do if you already are a blogger is to 
make a, um, a goal to write a blog post about that topic every week to write or if you're not a blogger or you could do this through a blog post to write at least, you know, 500 words or 800 words or a thousand words, really whatever is doable for you a week on the topic and just get going. And like, don't put necessarily any pressure on yourself if you start to kind of freak out and be like, oh my gosh, what do I write about? Like, just think about, well, first and foremost, do you want to write to a beginner? Do you want to write to somebody who's more intermediate? If you're not sure, I would just start with a beginner. What does a beginner need to understand about what you're an expert in to get started? And that can, you know, if you're a blogger, turn into a really great series of blog posts that can help a lot of people. Uh, but at the same time, I think it just comes down to, again, just getting the words out and then you can edit them later. Like, but just don't overanalyze it, I guess. I think a lot of us have the, um, you know, we think that again, it has to be perfect. We think that we have to know exactly where we're going and that's not necessarily true. You know, you might get a couple thousand words in and then decide that, oh, wait, I want to go in this other direction and that's okay. But just get writing and the whole process of writing becomes much easier. Well, let's say we've all taken that leap and we have written our book, our mm -hmm. first book. <laughs> what do we do when it comes to getting a book signing? And what do we do once we get there yeah. with the book signing? What are sure. some things like not just standing there? I have a book. You might say, you know, <laughs> what are some things? How do we get the book signing? And what do we do once we get the book signing? So I would really recommend starting out in your local community. So go to local uh, coffee shops. I know we have a locally owned coffee shop in my little town that does book signings. Um, local bookstores as well are great places to start. If your book relates to a topic that there would be like a specialty store on, for example, my Yoga for Runners book, I contact uh running stores and then offer okay. to, um, in addition to a book signing, for example, with yoga for runners, because it is so informative, I could then give a short seminar about that. Maybe even lead a quick yoga class for, you know, for my book, for somebody else's book. Uh, you know, for example, if you're doing a cookbook, you could do a quick cooking demonstration or something like that. Um, but just figure out a way to engage people with the content that of your book. Great. Oh, great advice. I think I that that would really go. Well for my <laughs> yeah. That. Oh, absolutely. And this would be perfect for you. Because books. I think that's what happens is you, you may get the book signing, but mm -hmm. then you don't know what the hell to do once you get there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that's so key to have more than just standing there with a book. Mm -hmm. Unless it's like some kind of a murder mystery, you know, <laughs> you got to do something to engage people. So I think those yeah. are great tips. Great tips. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, just start there. And then I think things will naturally snowball. <laughs> well, I have so much enjoyed talking to you today and you have been a wealth of information about writing and then you're so passionate. Where can every, you know, where can we reach you? on social media and connect with you and get your book. Yeah. So, um, the two big places I am with blogger to author, I'm on Facebook at facebook.com slash blogger to author. And I'm on Twitter at blogger to author. Again, I'm not inventive <laughs> with my naming. Um, if you're an Instagram user, uh, you can find me through my fitness blog, which is at sublimely fit. Um, and then my books are available on Amazon. So you can just find them there. That's Make awesome. sure to pick up a copy of Linda's book too. Sisterhood oh. of Sweat. Pick it up <laughs> if you haven't already. <laughs> well, thanks, Beth. I have really, <laughs> thanks for that plug. <laughs> I appreciate it. I got your back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have so enjoyed this podcast, working with you, being on your podcast yes. as well. And the name of your podcast for everyone to go check it out is the blogger to author podcast. Surprise, yeah. surprise. <laughs> Bells and whistles. It's awesome. You guys. So you can get more tips and uh, tricks from Beth and also 
hire her, which I plan on doing, <laughs> um, for some of her services, which uh, are worth their weight in gold, I must say. <laughs> I'm just happy to help people out. <laughs> awesome. But thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for listening to The Sisterhood of Sweat. Please give Beth and I a review on iTunes. Let us know how much this helped you, what tips you liked, and what you'd like to hear more of. Thanks again for listening to the Sisterhood of Sweat.